Welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on calculating energy costs. For today's webinar, we assume you are a non-technical business professional with an interest learning about managing electricity with the goal of saving energy. The examples used will be typical energy-intensive systems in non-residential places of work, such as office buildings, a campus, retail stores, government office buildings, or industrial processing plants. Although this webinar focuses on electricity, similar concepts can be applied to projects that save other natural resources, such as natural gas, water, and other environmental factors. And it all begins with measurement. Today we have a simplified agenda that will take about 30 to 40 minutes to review. In measuring electricity, we will review the basic formulas needed to measure it at your place of business. In calculating energy savings, we will expand the formulas to include price of electricity to calculate the cost of usage for common business equipment that have different efficiency ratings. With these basic formulas, we can perform a project evaluation for an improvement project that can save energy and money for your business organization. And lastly, we'll provide contact information for getting advice and help with projects uh, to make sure you get all the incentives and support it takes to get projects approved and completed. It has long been a basic tenet of good business training that management of managing anything starts with a focus on measurement. Measurement is the first step in good energy management. Measurement begins at the decision point of purchase of new or replacement energy intensive equipment and continues throughout the operations of your business unit over the life of the equipment. Labels on the box or on the equipment are required by federal code to show information about electrical requirements of the equipment. So that's usually a place we start for look, looking for measures. For electricity, the universal measurements that will be found on these labels are watts, volts, and amps. And it's these three that we will discuss in the following slides. Once you have purchased the equipment, these measurements of of electricity are difficult to change without expensive replacement or retrofit. Many of you here today have expressed or have been exposed to management training programs in the past. The PDCA or Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle pictured here is a common theme of many organizations. Measurement is crit critical in the planning stage and the checking stage. If your initial measurements in the planning stage are accurate and proved in the check stage, you will build credibility for getting your future projects approved. If you overestimate savings in the plan stage and your check stage shows that you didn't get the savings you planned on, then your credibility will go down. All organizations have a management cycle where budgets are established to fund the most deserving projects and initiatives for the coming years. Without good measurement and good credibility, projects won't likely get approval and funds. So volts, watts, and amps, the basic three terms of electricity that we need to do calculating of energy costs. Now these terms are part of any training program for professional experts and come from Ohm's Law, which is a much more complex and complete measurement of electrical energy fundamentals. Sometimes you may be in a room with experts and their terms will be slightly different. For example, volts may be shown as the letter E instead of a V. Amps may be shown as the letter I instead of an A. And watts may be shown as the letter P instead of a W. These simple math formulas we learned today are the same, regardless of what letters are used. Electricity is a very powerful and a useful energy source, but it doesn't have a physical form as most other resources we use, such as natural gas, gasoline, diesel fuel, coal, water. So it is common to explain electricity with analogies and visual aids. In this example, volt is shown as the driving force behind the amps as it tries to overcome the Ohm's re efforts to provide resistance. The most common analogy for electricity is visualizing the elements of a water system. The water pressure in your home 
or place of business is similar to the voltage pressure. A low water pressure problem is the same as a low voltage problem in that your equipment doesn't work well. The volume of water flowing through the pipe is similar to the amount of amps flowing through the wire. The total water delivered is a function of both the pressure and the flow, and the total electrical power used is a function of volts and amps. The size of the pipe the size of the pipe provides more or less resistance to the flow, and the size of the wire provides more or less resistance to the flow of the amps. So we start with our basic definitions. Volt, amount of force or potential applied. Again, think of the picture or think of the water system. The amount of electrons flowing through the wire is the amp. And if we have both high volts and high amps, we can have high watts. We're also going to introduce the term power factor, which we won't discuss today. It's an advanced term. Um, think of it as uh, a number between 0 and 1. And we were going to assume for all our math that the power factor is equal to 1. So volts times amps times 1 gives you watts. If you have three-phase equipment, you may have to introduce the square root of 3 for larger commercial and industrial operations, especially uh, motors. The ohm is the amount of resistance to the flow, but it will not be used in today's calculations. The combination of these three measurements determines the total power generated or consumed. Volts, amps equals watts. John? Yes. John, I have a question. Which of these terms, um, volts, amps, watts, power factor, and ohm, will a customer actually see on their bill? Oh, that's a great question, Beth. Uh, and I think the next slide will answer uh, most of the questions. So let's look at that. Some of the advanced terms and definitions we won't talk about today, but that will show up as you uh, keep going in your learning. Energy demand, that will show up on your bill. It has to do with the rate of use measured as kW. Energy use, that is the total energy used, is measured as KWH. Reactive demand may show up on your bill as a KVAR charge on the bill, kilovolt amp reactive. Demand response, this is an emerging offer to customers from their utility. Dispatchable standby generation, uh, utilities may put your backup generators to use when the region has a critical need for power. A time of use rate or schedule, a way to avoid demand charges by shifting your load to low times of, or times of use where the price is low. Uh, and also on peak and off peak are terms that you may hear about or see on your bill as two different rates for the price of, for using electricity. Using it on peak would be similar to I-5 freeway. Everybody wants to use it, uh, and so the price is going to be high to use it. Off peak, uh, not many people on the system, and the price of electricity would be much, much lower. So KWH, uh, this is a, a pretty interesting abbreviation or acronym, and it has three separate parts. Some acronyms, uh, such as NBA or MLS, stand for the National Basketball Association or Major League Soccer, one organization with an abbreviation of three letters. In this case, KWH is really three separate things laminated together. The magnitude is the first part of the acronym. We've said K in our little math formula, but it could be an M. If you read, read in the paper about big, big power plants, they would be measured in megawatts, not kilowatts. If you read the label on your equipment, it just may be in watts without any uh, magnitude indicator. My favorite on the metric system on the mag magnitude is the Yota Watt, Y-O-T-T-A. I believe it's 10 with 24 zeros behind it. Uh, so that is the metric system, and it's the first part of the acronym. The middle part is the unit of measure. If we're talking about watts, we could see KW. If we're talking about volts, you could see KV for kilovolts uh, and, and on with amps and ohms and other measurements. The last part is the uh, unit of time. Time is usually measured in hours for billing purposes and, and most of business operations. Sometimes you might see KWA or MWY. Uh, 
to represent an entire year, 8,760 hours in a year. Those are terms you may see, but for today, we will focus on K, W, and H. So let's try a simple little example here. Uh, we have 20 light bulbs in a particular room, and we want to know how much energy is used. The KWH accounts for most of your energy bills, uh, the energy on your bill. In this case, we have 20 light bulbs at 100 watts. That would be 2,000 watts. The next thing we want to do is to get to KW because the bill and the electricity prices are expressed in price per KWH. So we want to divide by 1,000 to get to point, uh, 2 KW is the same as 2,000 watts. And then finally, we have to determine how many hours of operation for this piece of equipment. In this particular case, you're only interested in looking at how many hours in the day is this uh, equipment on. Let's assume it's eight hours. If we take the two, kilowatt, two kW times the eight hours, we would get 16 kWh per day of using the lights in this room. So the basic formula now is in, in front of us. Watts divided by 1,000 times the hours of operation gives us kWh. For any piece of equipment, uh, we can determine the energy use. Sometimes you may need to know volts and amps and power factor in order to calculate watts. But most often you will find that watts are given to you from the labels on the equipment or by the energy bill or by a management software if you have one in your building. Labels on the boxes are required by federal code and must include the information about the electrical components. So here's a little pinup sheet if you want to have it handy and uh, put it somewhere. This is the basic formula. One bulb doesn't use a lot of electricity, but one customer I spoke to uh, had lots of bulbs. So let's try an example here. Using your arrow from your annotation tools, my arrow looks like that with my initials JM. I would like you to solve this little word problem. How many kilowatt hours are used by a 60-watt bulb that is on 10 hours per day for the next 30 days? So that's one billing cycle, 30 days, and we're trying to figure out how much one bulb contributes to that. So use your arrow and pick one of these that you think it might be. And, of course, the hint is the magic formula. John, yes. I just wanted to interject that if folks don't see those annotation tools, if you click on the marker icon in your upper left-hand corner beneath the Quick Start tab, they will appear. Thank you. Good reminder. Thank you, Beth. So while you're uh, doing that math in your head or just taking a wild guess, uh, one bulb doesn't use a lot of electricity, but one customer I spoke to years ago uh, had an auto dealership down on McLaughlin Boulevard in Portland, uh, and this business counted the number of bulbs that lit up the sales area both inside and outside the sales lot, and they had about 1,000 bulbs, and they were all incandescent. Uh, the monthly bill for this, we calculated at the time, was about almost $900 a month that he was spending on bulbs. So paying attention to something as small as the light bulb uh, can really add up to a lot of kilowatt hours. All right, I see many of you have jumped in, and uh, let's look at the answer here. It is 60-watt bulb divided by 1,000 times the hours of operation. In this case, 10 hours, 30 days, 300 hours. The answer would be 18. And you all are pretty accurate. So let's look at uh, the second problem. And we can think of my uh, business customer friend who had a 1,000 bulbs. Uh, what happens if he changes the bulb to an 18-watt compact fluorescent light bulb? Again, it's on for 10 hours uh, a day, 30 days. Now what is the calculation of energy use? While you're doing that, another customer story was a multifamily apartment complex. Almost uh, most of the units, 100 units, living units in this building, were individually metered and had their own electric meter. But the landlord's electric bill in the hallways, pathways, parkways, and common areas, and laundry rooms are all part of the landlord's electric bill. After taking inventory, he found over 600 light bulbs. So the potential savings are significant. 
I can see from the screen that uh, you have applied the formula correctly. All we did was change the 60 watt bulb to an 18 watt bulb and ended up with 5.4. And that is a 70% reduction in kilowatt hour usage for the one bulb. If we apply that to my two examples of having 1,000 bulbs or 600 bulbs, uh, the savings can be quite dramatic. So it's worth looking at uh, closely and running the numbers. So let's look at another uh, question. And again, you can use your chat uh, feature that here to send Beth you what you think the answer is. And I'm a, I like movies, and I find lots of electricity, uh, and I find this formula can be used in some movies. We're going to play Jeopardy. Uh, this is 1,210,000,000 watts is the answer. I want you to chat or use the chat window and send Beth. What is the question? Um, I was in the movies when I saw this and was elbowing my wife saying, ooh, ooh, and she said, please be quiet. But I, I just had to share that the, the map does show up in the movies. Yes. We have an answer from a participant. All right, don't say it yet. Okay. We'll see. Oh, we got we got two more answers. <laughs> oh, good. Well, there's uh, looks like uh, they're right on top of it. The the first hint is uh, this picture. The second hint is this picture. And uh, what, what what do most of the answers say, Beth? One point two one gigawatts. The power needed <laughs> to power a time machine. <laughs> And that is exactly what Doc Brown said was, uh, where and where am I going to get 1.21 gigawatts back uh, years ago? There was no single power source that was big enough, except, and the science was correct, lightning is in this category. Uh, we did have one more answer. The What is the output of the Boardman power plant? <laughs> <laughs> that would be uh, uh, an interesting guess. Uh, however, the... Uh, the output measured in uh, watts is uh, uh, 600 megawatts, so not close to 1.21 gigawatts. But again, a good guess. So you can see this amount of uh, uh, power is a very, very large number, and there were no power plants back in those days that could that could deliver that. Uh, so good guesses, and uh, way ahead of me there. But let's ask a little different question. If I turn around and use it for this webinar and say, how many kilowatt hours does it take to charge this electric vehicle in one second? Lightning, let's assume the lightning was one second. You now have the math to answer that. The math would look like 1,210,000,000 watts divided by 1,000. One second, there's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour, so there's one thirty-six hundredth of an hour. It takes 336 kilowatt hours per time trip, if you will. And at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, the simple math would be that it's costing you $33.60 per trip. That's a pretty cheap taxi fare for uh, uh, traveling through time. So the math even works in the movies is the message for this particular uh, chart. Well done, team. And I'm trying to advance. There we go. Power is sometimes expressed in tons. You may be in the room. Uh, the air conditioner, the refrigeration units, uh, anything that's trying to uh, make things uh, colder uh, may be expressed in tons, and you may hear, well, you need 10 tons, you need 5 tons, you need 100 tons of refrigeration or air conditioning. And you can convert that to watts. The key to this formula is that efficiency is going to be a big determinant of which unit you should really go for when you decide to buy one. In this case, I have a 5-ton unit. Uh, and I run through the formula and use something called the energy efficiency rating, or you might see seasonal energy efficiency rating. You may see other acronyms and abbreviations, but they are efficiencies. And the higher the number, the higher the efficiency. What that means is this top unit here can deliver five tons of uh, cold for only 6,000 for, 6, watts is what it's going to take to run that machine. In the second case, I can get the same five tons of coal, but with a higher efficiency, it's only 4,286 watts on the machine. 
that's an important distinction because it's 40% more efficient to buy the unit that's a higher efficiency. So efficiency ratings is another dynamic of looking at equipment uh, that you purchase or that you're running in order to figure out, am I getting enough cold or enough work out of this machine for the least amount of watts? So let's look at horsepower. Motors are very common uh, energy users in business and in industry, and there's a formula for that as well. Uh, again, a horsepower, that's an interesting concept if you look at the history. If you have a horse uh, and they pull on a pulley and raise uh, a person, an average man, uh, one meter in one second, that gives you one horsepower. So if any of you out there can come and lift me three feet for about one meter in one second, you can do a horsepower too. But efficiency ratings are very important in motors. In this case, I have five horsepower motor and another five horsepower motor, but they have different efficiency ratings. One, it takes 4,239 watts uh, to get me five horsepower, and the other one only takes 4,054 watts. Again, efficiency can save you money. 5% more efficient used for a motor. Now, if the motors have a lot of hours of use, uh, this can be a, a lot of watts or kilowatt hours on your bill in a hurry. So watch out for the efficiency ratings. Uh, I had one uh, business customer, when he found this out, um, start putting labels on the equipment because if the motor or the refrigeration broke on a weekend or the middle of the night, um, the orders were replace it very quickly. Just go out and get a unit and put it in. Well, if they replace some, uh, an efficient unit with a less efficient unit, you just locked in a lot higher uh, power costs for the next 15 years. So he put on there what the efficiency requirement was when and if this unit got replaced in an emergency. I thought that was a very smart thing for him to do. So let's talk about um, amps a little bit and wire size. Here's another example of why volts, amps, and watts are good concepts to learn. Remember we talked about the, the size of the pipe and the size of the wire. So the more amps you have, the bigger the wire size. Uh, the wire size is determined by the amps, not the volts. So in this case, I have a 60 horsepower motor uh, that uses about 48,000 watts, and I have a choice between buying the 60 horsepower motor that it runs on 480 volts or 240 volts. Those are two common voltages available to most businesses. Uh, and you may have someone say, wow, I got a really good deal on this uh, motor, and it uses 240 volts, um, and we're ready to go. Well, if that motor is on the far side of the warehouse or building from where the panel is, uh, where the electricity comes into the building, that's a long run of wire. And notice that the 240 volts times 200 amps whereas the 480 volts only takes 100 amps to get to that 48,000 watts. That means the cost of the wire is going to be much more in the 240 volt motor uh, than the 100 amp motor. Secondly, panels have a capacity rated in amps. For homes, the standard is 200 amps in a home. But for a business, it could be 2,000 amps. It may be that as you add equipment, the electrician comes and says, you're out of panel space. You need a new panel. Well, it may be that you can put in a 480-volt machine and have 100 less amps in that panel. So this slide is just a reminder of volts and amps are really important to keep track of, and it gives you more choices on how to save money, not just on your energy bill, but in the cost of installation in this case. So here's the cheat sheet. Um, some people I've talked to and taught over the years, they are algebra experts, and they say, great, I just need the formula, and I'll plug it in. Uh, but others want a step-by-step -step process. And so this is the one that I have found is the easiest to work with. Find the W is step one. Usually you can find it on the label. You don't have to do any of the math of volts times amps. Uh, find the label. Then let's get the K involved, so divide the watts by 1,000. Uh, then determine the hours of operation. Sometimes that's the least known factor, um, and you can calculate how many kilowatt hours, and then determine the price of that kilowatt hour. Uh, do the multiplication, and you have the energy cost. Or here's the 
algebra, plug in the formula, and go. So this is the formula that is most often needed to have a good starting conversation about uh, energy costs of a particular piece of equipment. So let's uh, use those annotation tools again and, and get your arrows out or mark it with uh, your marker. Let's solve this little word problem. What are the power costs for lighting in this office area? It has 40 fixtures, T8 fluorescent ceiling fixtures. Each is a three lamp fixture and it uses 90 watts. Lights are on 10 hours a day, seven days a week. It's eight cents a kilowatt hour and we'll let's assume a 30 day period in the month. Uh, and use your marker to uh, take a good guess at which one of these three is the answer of how much energy per month is used uh, in this area. What this reminds me of uh, is most problem solving around calculating energy costs and determining energy savings project is a little bit like a, a word problem. And you have to be a little bit of a crime scene investigator, if you will, uh, like on TV. You have to piece together all the facts and figure out how to use the formula correctly uh, to minimize the total cost of a project or understand the cost of the project. This is also an interesting calculation for someone who is in a school or a church complex that rents out rooms to people or groups. Uh, and you want to know, well, how much should I charge? And here's a way to say, well, this, I can tell what it's costing me for energy and water and other resources. You're going to need some of the math. Well, it looks like uh, the formula in this particular group today is pretty on top of it. Uh, the formula is 40 fixtures at 90 watts divided by 1,000 times the 300 hours times 8 cents, $86.40. Very good. So let's look at a second example. The customer has a choice between two air conditioning units. From the labels, one uses 1,200 watts, the other uses 1,000. And the one that's more efficient usually has more parts or better parts, and it costs you a little more. So to evaluate whether or not you want to buy the higher unit and get approval, you have to do some math. And it involves something called the payback period, the most common way that businesses use to judge and make decisions. The air conditioner, we've estimated at six hours a day, used about four months a year, assume a 30-day uh, month, and the cost is about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. How many years will it take to get back the $100? That is uh, the most common question you're going to run into. So let's look at the savings. 1,200 watts is one machine, 1,000 is the other. That's 200 watts in savings. You divide by 1,000 to get 0.2 kW. Your hours of operation for the year are four months at 30 days at six hours a day or 720 hours. So in our example, the energy bill savings would be 0.2 kW times 720 times 10 cents gets you $14.40 a year. Now we can calculate the payback. How quickly do you get the $100 back? And the answer is $100 divided by 14.40 says 6.9. It will take about seven years to pay back the $100 to your budget manager. For most businesses, this is probably beyond their tolerance for uh, using money. Usually it may be three years is very common, five years if you're a long-term thinking business. If you're a restaurant, it could be sometime measured in months, not years. It may be 18 months is my payback. So find out from your organization what the rules of thumb are, uh, and that would be very helpful to you to know which projects have the most likely uh, to get um, funding. Now, another important thing to consider is not just the equipment, but what about if you could get a rebate for this? What happens to the payback period? Well, that math would look like this. The payback period, instead of $100, would be $100 minus $50 divided by 1440 gets you 3.5 years. The payback period has dropped in half with that $50 rebate. So one of the things that you can keep track of is uh, what are the incentives out there? And though, even though a project uh, has a seven-year payback, 
with no rebate, six months later there might be a rebate which would totally change the perception of this project. So keep a list of these projects and keep checking on rebates every so often to see what's going on with those. I guess uh, one of the customers came to me and said he, he would sum it up to the people back at the office of no today doesn't mean never. It just means not now and keep coming back on good projects. So let's look at an example of a purchasing manager or apartment manager or a business manager who, who is purchasing bulbs as an example. You have uh, bulbs that produce the same amount of light, but one has a 13 watt rating and the other one has a 9 watt rating. In this case, compact fluorescence uh, and LEDs. The compact fluorescent is $2 a bulb and the LED bulb is $5 a bulb. Uh, I'd like to know what you think that your purchasing manager in your organization, which one of these do you think they would most likely purchase, the $2 bulb or the $5 bulb? Again, use your annotation tool uh, and tell me what you think might be the most uh, common purchase here to in face with this decision. Okay, I see we have some splits. Some people would say, oh, yes, they're going to go LEDs. Uh, and others say, well, a cheaper bulb might be the way that their purchasing department might work. So let's look at a couple of ways to examine this problem. The short-term look, 13-watt bulbs, 100 of them, versus 9-watt bulbs for 100 of them, you would have a 400-watt savings. Divided by 1,000 to get 0.4 kW, Hours operations are 12 hours a day, 30 days, 360 per month. Then the energy bill savings for one month would be 0.4 times 360 times 10 cents, 1440 per month. The incremental cost of the bulbs would be $5 bulbs versus the $2 bulbs would be $300 added purchase. The question is, how long does it take to get my $300 back? And the answer is, about 21 months or 1.75 years. So this decision is within most uh, businesses' uh, range of uh, rules of thumb, three years or less, two years or less. A restaurant, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it just depends on the business and what their time frame is for decision making. Now let's look at what we call a life cycle look. If you're gonna talk about energy costs and calculations, quite often, a life cycle term might pop up. Um, before I do that, Beth, uh, you've talked to many managers uh, and they're at PGE, including Mark Whitney, the lighting expert. What are other benefits uh, of the LEDs over this, uh, other than just cost savings? Well, um, yeah, John, uh, John, Mark did give me a, a list of additional benefits. And those include um, saving on labor because you replace your bulbs less frequently. There's less heat produced by an LED bulb, so you get lower AC costs. Most LED bulbs are dimmable. And it's okay if, um, if you have to switch them on and off frequently. They work well for that. And they work well in colder temperatures also. And lastly, um, there's no mercury uh, in a uh, LED bulb compared to CFLs. Thanks, Beth. Those are um, very good things to consider. Some of those you could actually add to your formula for savings, like labor savings, uh, less heat from air conditioning. Uh, so those things, and uh, businesses are required to recycle and pay for it usually, uh, CFLs because of the mercury content, whereas LED doesn't have the same requirement. So those sure. are other benefits that could uh, jump out here. So let's look at a life cycle look. You really aren't buying uh, bulbs, you are buying 24,000 hours of light. And so now we have a little different perspective. The 13 watt bulb you have uh, for 24,000 hours, you have to buy it three times because they only last 8,000 each. So you have a total investment cost of $2 times 100 times three. $600 is your purchasing outlay uh, in order to get 24,000 hours, 24, hours of light. The 13 watt bulb, you only have to purchase um, uh, the 13, the operating cost of the 13 watt bulb 
uh, 400 of them, divide by 1,000, times the 8,000, times 3, the 24,000 hours, times 10 cents, the operating cost would be $3,120. So you have $600 in purchase and $3,120 worth of operating costs. The 9-watt bulbs, you only had to purchase once the $500. The 9 watts times 100 divided by 1,000, 24,000 hours, 10 cents, you would have $2,160 operating costs with an outlay of $500 for purchasing. So the total cost over the life cycle of 24,000 hours is the purchase plus the operating energy cost, $3,720 compared to $2,660. The 9-watt bulb will be about 28.5% cheaper for the same amount of life over 24,000 hours. And we haven't even included the cost of, uh, we didn't have the labor cost of replacing the bulbs uh, for the 13-watt bulbs. So this is what is a life cycle look. You may be uh, more and more required to look at it this way for businesses who think longer term or want to include other benefits over the life of the equipment. So that's about the extent of the math that you'd have to know to do some pretty good uh, examination of costs and savings and payback period. But another thing that is starting to come uh, more and more into energy management is to look at the shape of things. In this case, uh, all I've done is to take monthly bills for four years and plot them using an Excel program. And so what I've got here is um, I have uh, a change in a piece of equipment. It was used for basically a heat pump that was used for heating during the winter uh, and a little bit of air conditioning during the summer and changed from a standard efficient e standard efficiency unit to a very high efficiency unit. And sure enough, the two years up here are the older uh, unit before I replaced it, and I had, there were some pretty high energy uses. Down here, these two years were the two years after the change when we went to the more high efficiency equipment. And there's about a 40% difference in winter bills uh, because of going to the higher efficiency unit. So sometimes if you have someone or a team or a group or a manager you're trying to communicate with and they don't know the numbers, you can at least show them the picture. Show them the shape and say, look, we want to change our shape here. The shape of this needs to change to the shape of this, and we want to get rid of all these energy costs. So it's another way to explain uh, the numbers when uh, a lot of people need a visual uh, and you can put a, a map on the wall every quarter and see what the shape of things looks like. So it's a very effective way even if you don't have a lot of detail. Here's a case that it's a, it happens to be a school building. Uh, it's uh, got an energy management system on it and it knows how much energy is used every single hour of the day. When I first saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm confused. And they said, no, 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 you can ask really intelligent questions from this picture without uh, having to know a lot of math, a lot of numbers, but just imagining the hours of operation compared to the energy use. So here we have midnight down here. Let me get my arrow back. Here we go. Down here we have the uh, hours, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, here's noon, and we're back to midnight. So we have a 24-hour clock that starts at midnight and ends at midnight. And sure enough, the energy use around 8 o'clock or so, uh, everybody has shown up. The, the teachers are there. The students are there. Everything's cranked up. Everything's going on all the Mondays through Fridays. So this chart up here is all the Mondays through Fridays are right along here. Down here is the four Sundays of the month. And down here are the four Saturdays of the month. So one of the first questions uh, that the energy manager for the school asked is, why are Sundays higher than Saturdays? Uh, and they did some research and found out, well, sure, on Sundays they were renting out uh, the uh, auditorium to uh, a church group. And so you had energy use, and they had Sunday schools and lots of activities. 
So now you have a way to measure the difference between Sundays and Saturdays and know exactly how much money do I need to charge to make sure I'm covering the cost of the energy uh, for this particular energy, for this use, for this group. So you can ask some pretty intelligent questions uh, by simply looking at the shape and then asking staff to go get you some answers. Here's a case in the middle of the night at uh, between one and two every night, something came on and stayed on all the rest of the night. And the answer wasn't quickly coming. And finally, uh, someone in the IT department raised their hand and said, I think I know what that is. We're backing up all the computers in the building. And we bought, bought some software that turns on all the computers, backs up the disks, um, and then they keep running until people come in in the morning. Um, the manager asked the question, well, why doesn't it go back down if it only takes an hour? And the answer was the software uh, isn't uh, smart enough to know how to turn the computers off. So if they had bought some software that turned the computers off, they could save this much energy by looking at the energy shape. And in fact, the uh, building manager said, I'll buy the more expensive software for the IT department. Uh, in order to save that amount of energy every single day of the year. Uh, so it's pretty effective to look at load shapes to start the, uh, asking the intelligent question and ending up with a chart that could show here's the before, here's the after, and we actually did save it. The other question that was asked is why so long for the power to uh, energy use to drop off? This was kind of confusing because it's a school and the students and the teachers are gone pretty early. And they would have expected the energy use to taper off more quickly. Turns out that the um, janitor service is there and they would turn all the lights on in all the uh, classrooms. And as they cleaned the room, then they would turn the lights off. And in that way, they knew which rooms had been cleaned and which rooms hadn't. And, of course, it sure shows up as energy use, which is not something they worried about. So if you change the process of the janitors to where uh, they have some other method of keeping track of the lights and only have the lights on when they're in a room, then this could look a lot different. They could change this shape uh, quite a bit and get it to go down a lot faster and cut this shape and make it drop off dramatically. Again, the shape can tell you uh, a, a lot about what's going on, and you can ask some very good questions uh, just by looking at shape. So we're kind of getting to the end here, and we can summarize what, are, what areas do you focus on. Number one is you can always focus on changing behavior, the don't waste energy, the conservation approach. Uh, if the lights aren't getting turned off, let's put a sign, please turn the lights off. Uh, maybe consider motion sensors. Uh, look for ways not to waste energy when you don't really need it. Another way is deferred maintenance. Uh, quite often you cut um, budgets by looking at maintenance, but we've seen the efficiency of a particular piece of equipment can really affect the amount of kilowatt hours used. So if you haven't um, maintained a particular piece of equipment on the roof that does your air conditioning and it hasn't been maintained or the filters haven't been changed, you're going to have a lot more watts, uh, watt hours, than you, uh, than, than you would if you made the equipment maintenance and get it to the efficiency rating it should have. So don't defer maintenance. Don't waste energy. Next thing is to look at process. We already saw with the janitors that if we change their process, we could dramatically reduce the kilowatt hours. So procedures and processes are another way to go after it. Measuring and monitoring. Detect unexpected conditions. Again, why are Sundays higher than Saturdays? So your process of monitoring and measuring need to be implemented in, on a regular basis. Ask the good questions. And finally, um, get ahead of the curve and get to the purchasing managers before uh, they replace equipment or buy equipment and really look at higher efficiency equipment. What is the cost? What is the savings? What are the life cycle uh, implications of making that purchase decision? Those are the three areas I would say you could start initiatives and get support for with a, a team back at, at uh, an office or a campus. So 
My next steps to give you a list, establish and management feedback process to measure and monitor energy use from operations. And it's not just energy and electricity. It could be natural gas, it could be water. Uh, start that feedback process. Start measuring it, start monitoring. Second, compare that use with some kind of benchmark. The first case I showed you on the shape chart was to compare it to my old use. So eat, just look at your last three-year average and compare what's going on today and, and know whether you're using above or below my historical number. A lot of times if you call the energy experts uh, that we'll give you at the end of this webinar, they will have standards such as, oh, well, for an office building, the standard is so many kilowatt hours per square foot of office space. Uh, in the food processing industry, I know they have standards of how many kilowatt hours per pound of food. Um, so look for benchmarks in your industry. Uh, ask some energy experts for those. Develop and maintain a list of projects. We already saw that just because a project didn't pencil out today doesn't mean it won't pencil out tomorrow. Get a hold of your capital budgeting uh, manager or um, analyst and say, what are your rules of thumb? Uh, in the businesses I was in in the utility industries years ago, five years was the most common number. In others, it might be three years. Keep learning is the last piece. Uh, stay abreast, abreast of changing technology. It may be that the last time you looked at a project, the efficiency available was X, and today there's been a breakthrough and the, the new equipment is even more efficient. It may change the paybacks and the life cycle looks. So those are my four uh, recommendations to get started with good energy management. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Beth and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I just wanted to point out <clears throat> here before we start the questions uh, that um, if you have questions about uh, your sites or you'd like a free energy efficiency consultation either over the phone or in person, you can contact um, Paula Conway if you're a commercial customer or Stacy Milliman if you're an industrial customer, and those names are listed on this slide. And I want to point out that you can continue to submit questions to me through chat, and I will ask them of John. And John, our first question is uh, a technical one, so get ready. It might be a little hard. <laughs> if I if I measure a three-phase 460-volt motor power at 15 amps, <laughs> ready? Do I still yeah. have to multiply by power factor to estimate KW? Uh, my I'm a business major, and what I've been taught is, yes, if you're working down at the volts times amps formula, you need to know the power factor of the equipment involved. And that can be a function of whether the motor is highly loaded or variable speed or fixed speed. And that's where you need to call uh, the experts, uh, Paula Conway and Stacy up here uh, on your screen. They have access to professional uh, PEs, mechanical and electrical engineers, that can really get in and, and work through industrial motors uh, calculations. And that's where you have to call in the experts if, when you're dealing with power factor. But the, the simple answer is yes, both times amps times power factor times the square root of three is the formula for figuring out uh, the uh, watts for particular uh, motor use. But with motors, it depends on the load. Uh, and that's a technical calculation. You have to have an engineer. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, our next question is, where do I find the amount of watts used for a specific piece of equipment? And um, where can I find a list of more efficient similar equipment and the wattage used by this, this uh, similar equipment? Um, as I said, there's, by code, there has to be a label. Even if you go you go up on the roof and you look at an old HVAC unit, you're going to find somewhere there is a label that is going to give you the information you need. I would also check uh, some very good websites. Uh, energystar.gov has uh, a lot of good information for homes and businesses on equipment and efficiency ratings. Uh, and then Energy Trust of Oregon here in town, I think it's energytrust.org, is another good website to keep track of efficiency of equipment and of incentives. 
uh, both the Energy Star and the Energy Trust can lead you to where is the money that's going to help me fund the project. So those are two good sites. And, and there may be even more that are known by Paula and Stacy, uh, the two contacts on your screen. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and um, the next question is, are there – well, I think you just answered this question. <laughs> are there resources or websites where I can find what the best rated equipment uh, are? So did you already – is that one you answered, or did you have additional resources for that? I, th I think that, that you start with the two websites I mentioned, energytrust.org and energystar.gov. Uh, but again, for example, the question about the motor. Uh, I, I would go immediately to Stacy Milliman on the screen there. He deals with industrial customers, and so on staff they're going to have engineers that know exactly what's going on and can do the calculations and uh, give you information about equipment. Uh, and what the current standards are in efficiency rating. So, uh, yeah, I think we've already answered it. Great, thank you. Um, and if you call Stacy, Stacy is uh, a female, so just just a word to the wise. Ah. Um, <laughs> next question is, John, you mentioned talking to purchase managers about the cost and length of use. Do you have any suggestions for talking to them? What what kind of calculations should I be showing them? Uh, the page or the slide that involves life cycle I think is a very good slide to have a discussion with purchasing managers and ask them what approach they use to purchase equipment or are they simply using uh, the payback, the, the short-term look. There are also webinars and seminars uh, that are coming up at PGE uh, that they might consider uh, coming to in engaging in, the, in more in-depth uh, four-hour classes on energy costs and energy management. And uh, there used to be one for chief financial officers and their staff. So keep learning, keep checking in with Beth and uh, the PGE website that talks about upcoming seminars. And go to take one along and go together is the way I would do it. Thank you, John, for that plug. I appreciate it. And the last question we have is, uh, where do you find the ER and C, uh, sorry, the energy efficiency rating and the seasonal energy efficiency rating type uh, of info when equipment is not labeled with it? Again, if it's not labeled, and it should be, if it's not labeled or you can't read it, you really need to talk to people who work with that equipment all the time. And that gets back to the phone numbers, the, the, the energy experts. Uh, we already talked about there's a lighting expert, Mark Whitney, there at Portland General Electric. He's, he is a lighting designer certified person. He's going to know exactly how to help you. For motors and industrial, Stacy is going to have access to a whole staff of engineers. Uh, so if it's not labeled, you need to ask. But motors are going to have the efficiency rating on the nameplate. Uh, you should be able to find it that way most of the time. Great. Thank you, John. And that was our last question, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today.